Before we jump in, a note on our content. This is created for adult audiences only. We advise listener discretion. We have discussions about sexual violence against women. We use bad swear words. We talk openly about women's autonomy. And you might just hear some opinions that don't jive with your own. Growing up in America, I remembered those dinner parties where invariably I would catch some aunties trash talking the girls there, girls who were my friends. I became really good at staying out of their orbit, but that observation of Desi society, transplanted in America, of grown women giving their verdicts, often to girls' faces, you'd be so pretty if you lost a little bit of weight, such a shame about her skin color, came back to me as I read a book called Unladylike. Hello, hello. This is Her Ganjo Won't Smudge. I'm Shauna. Join me as I talk to Desi women who are imagining a better, fair world, free of all those unwritten social rules that tell us just how to be a good Desi woman. Today I'm speaking to Radhika Vaz, the author of Unladylike, and someone who observes society for a living. I guess you could even call it one of her professional skills. Radhika is a comedian. She's also an author, a scriptwriter, an actor. I reached out to Radhika because her book was so full of observations about how women are treated in Desi society. Like, why is there so much pressure for women to have kids? As if a woman is only a woman if she's had kids? Or why is marriage seen as this pinnacle of success for a woman? So if you get married at 20, what is it like, all downhill from there? And today with me, Radhika is going to contemplate what the world might look like if women just stopped getting married. So this is how we're going to do it. We're going to kick off Her Kajal Won't Smudge, episode one, season one, with the indomitable Radhika Vaz. I read your book, Unladylike, and it cracked me up. I mean, seeing the world from your eyes, how you experienced life as a little kid, your life in boarding school, and then as an adult, your life in New York City, working at an advertising agency. I have to say, I have lived in New York City, I have done the corporate thing, and I would have had way too much stage fright to put myself out there in an improv class. What made you give that a go? So the thing is, is that when I was in school, I was a terrible student, academically, extremely weak. uh, And there are many reasons for that. But essentially, I was always just more drawn to any kind of performance. It could have been for 10 people or the whole school. Just so long as there was some sort of performing element involved, I was really happy. And whether I was good or not didn't even matter. I was too young to care at the time. But I did enjoy it. I think I just had the reputation for being the one who'd take the piss out of myself as well. So when I joined improv, a lot of my friends were not so surprised that I had done it. And that one improv class changed the trajectory of your life. I joined the class completely by accident. It was more like I thought to myself, oh, I'm in New York, I should do something. I always kind of enjoyed acting. So maybe I'll look up an acting class and see how that goes. Mm -hmm. I was also a little bit lonely, to be honest. I mean, I love New York, but it kind of was a bit of an anticlimax because I had a job and I had a boyfriend, I had a few friends, but I was like, where's this sexy buzz that New York's like, why am I not buzzing? Where's sex in the city for me? Mm. And then I realized you kind of have to make that for yourself wherever in, in the world you may go. And so for me, improv became that thing. I looked forward to it and and slowly I began to learn the structures around a joke and comedy and, you know, what it really takes to to be funny consistently because I think that's the difference between just having fun with it and then wanting to make it into a career. It took several years before I could even think that this could be a career move. And I only moved back to India in 2014. So by then I'd been doing improv for 10 years. In the US, comedy is one of those male 
dominated fields. It feels, it seems like it's really hard for women to break into comedy. In India, was it that everybody, men and women, were in the same boat because it was such a young industry when you started? No, that's never the case. I just feel like we still, in India and the world, is still so patriarchal, so sexist. It doesn't matter whether you're a comedian, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a journalist, you could be a lawyer. It doesn't matter where you are. If you're a woman and you're a professional, you are up against the majority, which is always going to be male because that's just the way it's built. And in India, it's actually still quite bad because, you know, a lot of girls aren't even allowed to go out at night. Hmm. I mean, how are we going to have more and more young comedians come into the business? Thankfully, we do, because a lot of them are pushing. I mean, there were girls who would work till 8 o'clock at night and then catch like a train and come to the club and then at 12 o'clock at night be like going home in India, in trains, in auto rickshaws, in Ubers, where, I mean, it's not even safe half the time. Right. And they're lying to their moms and dads and telling them where they are when they're not at work. They're doing this and they're so passionate about it. And it's, it is easier for men. So it's not even that, I'm not even saying the comedians are sexist, although many of them are. I am saying that the society in which we operate is so sexist that it basically prevents and precludes women from joining almost any industry. It's not just comedy. It's institutionalized. What is the source for you? How do you come up with your material? I'm not necessarily very topically oriented. So I'm not the girl who reads the newspaper and comes up with that hilarious sort of like take on the news. I have friends who are spectacular at that and I love them for it, but that's just not my thing. My thing has always been the female condition, you know. Why do women do the housework? Why is 75% of the load of housework always on the female? So I'll give you an example. It was not assumed that my husband would have children. In fact, the assumption was almost like, oh, he's probably not going to want to have children and she's going to have to force him to have those kids. In the meantime, I was like, I don't want to have kids. So I know how people think about women. And so it's always bothered me. And I think as I've got older, it's just bothered me more. The female condition. You call yourself a feminist. So did your feminism come first or was it through your improv and observing people that you became a feminist? When did you realize, hey, you know what? I am a feminist. So here's the thing. I was probably, when I look back on it, always a feminist. Mm -hmm. Just my behavioral patterns and the way I spoke of things and the way I thought of things was very feminist. Now, the thing is, is that in my teens and 20s, I was in India. And we didn't have mainstream feminism the way we have it today. Feminism was very intellectual. We didn't have the language that young women have today Mm -hmm. on the street, like the most... You just have to have an Instagram account to understand what feminism is. You see what I'm saying? Yes. We didn't totally. have that at all. But at that age and at that time, I'm talking about like, you know, the 80s and the, and, and the early 90s. There was no language. We didn't know anything about it. We didn't give it much thought. When I came to the United States, I remember the first time I had to consider my words and how I was thinking. And this has nothing to do with comedy, but... I had a job in media at a very right-wingy kind of a place. They were right-winger-ish. And I didn't even know or care what that was because I just moved to the US. I just wanted to keep my freaking job. And so I didn't think one way or another of Democrats, Republicans, left, right, nothing. But I remember this one lady was saying something to the effect of how Hillary Clinton is just such a bad first lady and that a first lady should know that, you know, like Jackie Kennedy was a great first lady. Mm. Like I'm not even a Democrat, but Jackie Kennedy was a great first lady. And I remember thinking, Jackie Kennedy was a great first lady and this Hillary Clinton. And I kind of like took on just sort of this opinion that I'd heard that I didn't really even think that much about. And then I was talking to my husband, who was at that time just my boyfriend, whatever. And he and another friend, another male friend, Indian guy, we were talking about this. And both of them were horrified with me, not because they're feminists, but because they love Bill Clinton so much, which is so ironic. 
Uh, but they they said she's amazing. Like Hillary Clinton is like the bomb, and she's so smart. And uh, you know, uh, Jackie Kennedy, are you kidding me? And like, who are these women in your office? And I was like, yeah, yeah, you guys are right. Hillary Clinton's amazing. And I remember thinking, I have to make up my fucking mind. Like yeah. I have to figure out, am I Jackie Kennedy or Hillary Clinton? It, it was not even that articulate, but I remember thinking, okay, there's a decision to be made here. There's something I need to think about. Mm-hmm. Clearly, someone's wrong, and the other person's right, and I need to figure out whose sort of team I'm on. Didn't give it much thought until I started writing my first show, and I was talking to a journalist who had seen the first sort of. My first show was also called Unladylike, and she came to it. I don't know how she came to it. She was from the Huffington Post, and she was a really nice girl, really young. And her first question to me was, and my director of that show, Brock, and she asked us both. We both were in this interview, and she said, "Are you a feminist?" That was the first question she asked me after watching the show. "Are you a feminist?" And I literally was like, "Fuck! What am I to? I should have had a response to this. I mean." one hour long show about how women are not mm. really equal to men and how am i fumbling that you know but luckily before i could say or do anything brock goes can i just say something and she was like yeah and i was please and he goes i am embarrassed by any woman who is not a feminist and then when she came back to me i said i'm a feminist definitely i don't need my director being embarrassed of me but i think that's when i also realized yeah i am a fucking feminist that is what i am you did a show and you asked your audience how many of you out there are feminists feminism means that women want to be treated equally to men nothing more than that yeah and you were surprised by you know some women who were not raising their hands why do you think that is are women afraid to call themselves feminists you know i don't even know if it's fear look there is the stigma especially in well all over the place that you know except in extremely i would say woke communities of people there is the thing of feminists you know they're just ball busters and bra burners radicals troublemakers exactly you know they still think that they want to put men down and people who don't know what feminism actually is who don't realize that feminism is very simply just anybody male or female who wants equality political social and economic equality for women we just want parity with men we don't want men to have less political agency we don't want men to have less economic agency we don't want men to have less social agency we just want the same that's all we want but people don't know that they just think oh they want everything and they want to kill all the men and like there are a lot of women who don't think they need feminism so you know i had an interesting conversation with this person that i know very well she has a 19 year old daughter and we were talking there was a group of us and she said i'm not a feminist and i said but you've raised such a strong 19 year old girl like you know and wouldn't you want her to have all the same opportunities as as say that young man over there that her her classmate and she goes oh no of course i wanted to say have the same opportunities but i don't think i need feminism who needs feminism in our country are our domestic staff you know women from disadvantaged backgrounds so i kind of got what her confused thinking was but let me put it this way i kind of could see how she came up with this theory but it's still flawed so if a woman is super lucky like this woman who doesn't need feminism because she's managed to do whatever she wanted to do in life great but the problem is that luck that russian roulette and that i think is what we're talking about and why we're talking about feminism in 2014 radhika teamed up with british pakistani comedian and writer nadia manzoor to create a web series on youtube called shugs and fats where they both play the main characters the storyline is about two muslim women who wear headscarves and long kaftans they're curious about life trying things out and we see them observe life navigate life and try to fit in in liberal brooklyn the show has been featured on npr's fresh air the new york times the daily beast and has gotten a bunch of press let's talk a little bit about shugs and fats so when we conceived of shugs and fats so i'll, I'll just take this back to the first time i came up with a muslim character So what had happened was and that's why for me the basis of it is very important to explain. This must have been around 2006 or 7 and I would go on these auditions 
And all of the auditions that I would get called for were mostly for the subjugated, subservient Muslim mom. And they would always tell me to bring like a scarf to the freaking audition so that I could cover myself and sit there. And I'd have one line which would be, don't take my son to jail or please leave my husband. Like it was always that. That was it. That was the one note, one line that I would audition for and still not even get that. But the point being, I remember one day I was sitting in the subway. I had finished shooting some freaking student film again about like subservient, not even being made by Muslims, being made by whoever. And I was just thinking, are you fucking kidding me? Do you people not know any Muslim women? I lived in Bombay. I've lived in India like most, I mean, my whole growing up years. My dad's from Bombay and he lived, he grew up in a neighborhood called Baikala. Very big Muslim population and quite a lot of Christians. My dad's Christian. But in our building, my grandma's building, it was, I think, maybe two or three Christian families and maybe like 10 Muslim families. Okay. And my recollection is not one of those women was subservient to anybody. This is my personal feeling is that every single religious group has manage to take women and frankly fuck us okay and you can ask orthodox Mm -hmm. jews you can ask women from conservative hindu families you can ask women from conservative christian families they all feel like you know what we're getting screwed too so Mm -hmm. it's everywhere but it really irritated me as a as a brown woman that this particular group of women were being beaten up and in a stupid way, like we're not subservient. At least you want to show Muslims as, you know, you're still in your 9-11 world. You still want to show them as like the terrorists who are going to jail. Fine, but at least show the women with more dimension. I remember sitting there thinking this. And by the time I got to my stop 20 minutes later, I had this monologue in my head for this ball busting conservative Muslim woman and The only way I could show she was conservative was if she wore an abaya and a hijab. And I based her totally on sort of like my grandmother and all these other ladies who lived in that building. And then when I got the opportunity to make the project bigger, I told Nadia about it. And then both of us sort of came up with shooks and fats. And the reactions that we got were so polarized. I mean, we either got, that is the most hilarious thing I've seen in my life. We love that these two are out there not having a clue and catcalling men and, you know, misunderstanding stuff about the U.S., but still being excited about being there. And we also got, you know, your being disrespectful to the culture. Nadia is Muslim. She's not hijabi, but she is Muslim. So, yeah, we got both the the comments that it's hilarious. We love it. Keep doing it. And you're being disrespectful to the culture. I mean, for me, I could imagine you would have gotten a lot of those, you know, people saying that they're offended. Mm -hmm. And it made me think that why can't girls in abayas and hijabs and burqas be funny and curious? It's like they can't be anything but what the men want them to be, which is the good Muslim woman. Yeah, it's men, but it's also women. I think one of the biggest problems feminism has well, it's not the biggest problem. It's one of the problems that, that feminism does suffer sometimes is that we don't get a full buy-in from women. If every single woman decided that being feminist was what they wanted to be, and if they really looked into their lives and picked out all the places where the patriarchy has been pushing them around and decided that that wasn't going to happen anymore, that would be the ideal world and we, would, you know, we wouldn't have sexism and we wouldn't have patriarchy anymore. The fact is, you know, like you said, it's also about luck. Nadia and I are in a position where we could do those sketches. We both came from families where we didn't have brothers or fathers or mothers or uncles or aunties or anybody telling us that, listen, you do that sketch one more time and I swear to God. We were independent women who could go out there and create comedy. And so we were lucky and we could do it. I didn't mind the commentary from Muslim women about being distress, you know, like the, the feeling from some quarters, especially hijabi women who said, this is so disrespectful. I was willing to engage in why they thought that. Unfortunately, a lot of people aren't willing to engage in that sort of like productive way. I want to talk about the catcalling episode of Shugs and Fats. 
So picture this. Shooks and Fats are in Central Park and they're huffing and puffing after having gone for a run in their long kaftans. Nice one, Fats. That was proper good. We nearly made a whole lap this time. Yes, yes. I'm sweating buckets under here. Oh, just blow out. Blow out. Let the breeze in. Oh, this feels very nice. We listen to them chatting on the bench. And when they hear the guys sitting on the bench next to them, cat-calling women as they walk by, you see Shugs and Fats look at each other, and it's like a light bulb has gone off in their heads, and they think, oh, is this what we're supposed to be doing in America? Oh, look at those arms! Bulky So they start cat-calling the guys sitting next to them. And the guys get so offended. And when they get up to walk away, you two continue catcalling them. So it's sort of this innocent misunderstanding of patriarchal constructs like harassment on the street and how men get away with all of this shit that women probably would never. And then just taking it in and having some fun with it. This stuff has been going on for so long. I remember when I was living in New York City, I used to wear my headphones when I would be walking down the street, even if I wasn't actually listening to anything, because I realized that if I did that, the construction workers would not say anything to me because they wanted me to hear them, right? Oh, that's so funny. I have heard from women in Pakistan that when they can't walk in public spaces, you know, they get touched up, felt up. That happens. You know, men will do this blatantly. And I've had guys tell me, look, it's not our fault. Men just can't control themselves. What do you say to that? I say, fuck off. (laughs) I mean, what do you even say? It's so pathetic, you know. I don't know if this has gotten worse. You've heard of Nirbhaya, the huge gang rape case. Nirbhaya is Hindi for fearless. And it's the name people gave Jyoti Singh a 22-year-old student who went out one night in Delhi in December 2012 to watch a film with a male friend. After the film, she boarded a bus and was beaten, gang-raped, and tortured by six men who left her for dead. She was flown to Singapore in the hope she could be saved, but she died from her injuries. Women and men took to the streets in mass protest, demanding that something be done. One of the rapists was interviewed, and he absolved himself and blamed the victim by saying, decent girls don't go out in public at night. That happened in Delhi in 2013, I think, 2012 maybe. It was horrific. And Indian women, gang raping and raping and domestic rape and all of that. It's just, India is one of the most dangerous countries in the world for women. I mean, this is so sad, given that we're one of the largest democracies and blah, 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 blah. And we're right behind like war-torn countries. So we have a terrible reputation when it comes to women's safety. But something about that particular case, I think it was that she was this young middle-class girl with a job. She was in a really public place in Delhi, in a bus with another male friend. I mean, what more, what else are we supposed to do to stay safe? And there was this huge outcry. And then we all talked about it so much. And what is it about spaces in India that are just so unsafe for women. So for example, we talked about this thing where you have these parks all over the place. And, you know, if you're a single girl and you have a break from work, the boys can leave work, go buy their cigarette and their chai and go into the park and just sit there and like enjoy themselves. You will never see a woman alone walk into one of those parks Mm. because you just don't know, even in broad daylight, you just don't want to be alone in a place like that. We are so afraid. There's this base level fear all the time. It's not, oh, men can't help themselves, you know. Partly, uh, I think also how societies have raised their boys and Mm -hmm. turn the other way when they do that in their homes and around their elders. Let's talk about another skit. I'll try to set the stage. So Shugs gets her period and you banish her to a corner of the apartment, cordoning off the area with this yellow crime scene tape. You tell her she's bleeding for her sins because, well, she sins every month. 
When she asks you a question in a normal tone of voice, you tell her to stop screaming, you know, a dig at how women on their periods are hormonal and hard to manage. When she goes to the bathroom, you wait outside dressed in a hazmat suit with a bucket in your hands. And when Shugs opens the door, her sanitary pad is wrapped in so much tissue paper. It's like the size of a football. And you tell her you're going to Staten Island to dispose of the toxic garbage because, well, you know, obviously that's where toxic garbage goes to die. We're in the future. I don't think they do this in the future. Shugs, you know, this is the only way. Yeah, but I heard it, that. It's your week of shame. It is our punishment from God. But it happens every month. Yes, that is because every month you do wrong things. If you stop doing wrong things, then you will stop bleeding from your vagina. Why did you want to do a skit about the menstrual cycle? Well, I think, you know, I mean, if you grew up in, in India or I'm imagining Pakistan, Bangladesh, all pretty much the same. There's a huge stigma around the female period and the woman is impure. And that doesn't matter if you're Muslim, Hindu or whatever, you're impure. And in fact, my own mother-in-law would not let my sister-in-laws into the kitchen if they had their period. So you're so impure that, and in the olden times, you were probably like sequestered in your room for those mm. five days and nobody could go near you because you would defile them. And the period is like such a big like secret. It's like if you have your period, you can't tell anyone. And if you stain something, it's like, oh my God, and you have to be ashamed of it. And so we knew that we would address that somehow. And so obviously taking the dirty, you know, you're a dirty person if you have your period and taking it to a far extreme of like, you know, don't come beyond this crime scene, <laughs> stay there. You're like, you know, and then hazmat suit so that you don't get any of the period sort of fumes on you. And so all of that ex <laughs> extreme stuff. And then I think it was Nadia probably who said that that's something that in the Islamic culture, like in her family, it was believed that, you know, the reason women bled was because they were bleeding for their sins. So that was included in the sketch for that reason. If a man has a cold and he, you know, is sneezing everywhere, he's definitely contagious. And I don't think that stops him from going into a sacred place. No, women can't go, obviously, into the puja room or a temple in India if they have their period. Same for the Orthodox Jewish women, uh -huh. for Muslim women. Same thing. Yeah. I'm fascinated by this thing with tradition. I mean, just because it's old, does that make it the right way to do things? You know, how much of patriarchy and morality policing of women do we think is just tradition? Some traditions are lovely. And so long as they don't put any particular person in through any kind of inconvenience or pain, they should totally be upheld. And there's certain types of traditions that all religions have, and, and some of them are lovely. But when the tradition is built on the fact that the female is a second-class citizen, I think that needs to go. You know, I was just thinking when you and I first started talking, and you were saying about how you started to notice in your own life, you know, how come... I work, I have the kids, and it kind of feels like my husband's life hasn't changed. And I think all women feel that way, regardless of what social, socioeconomic bracket you are from. But I literally feel that the only way that we can reverse patriarchy is if women just stop getting married. Nobody get married moving forward. So let's just take marriage firstly and get rid of it, okay? Along with marriage, so much shit is obviously already off the table, all right? Now, let's talk about a need for a particular woman who's not married to have a child. Now, first of all, if we all decide we're not going to get married, then firstly, we're all going to have to be economically independent. So while, yes, initially, there might be the situation of a lot of women being paid slightly less than their male counterparts, there will come a point where that gap will completely be closed. And as for, you know, having children... I bet once we decide that no more marriage, there will come about some kind of equity around that too. Once you say there's no marriage, there's not a chick that I know who's going to be like, yeah, you know what, I'll get knocked up, carry this kid around and fuck my body up for nine months and then forget nine months, then I go through the whole thing of childbirth and breastfeeding, okay? And I'll take a back seat for like a whole year for my career and I'll do it for nothing. 
no, that's never going to happen again because she's not married to you. She does not have any obligation to that shit. You're going to step up to the plate and you're going to reimburse her for what she did. And that will just start mm. making things equal. Now, I know this is this utopian society that I'm thinking of, but I almost feel like we don't have another way out. So talking about tradition, when some easily offended men don't like what you're saying, there's a lot of, quote unquote, you're a slut, you're a whore. And I see that on your social media pages. Yeah. So are you a whore? No, just kidding. <laughs> yes. That is hilarious. Are you a whore? Why do you think men call you a slut? Because they don't know the meaning of the word whore and they don't know the meaning of the word slut. They just know that that is the worst thing you can say to a woman. Right. Like the worst thing an Indian woman can be called is randi. Because you have to be a pure as driven snow virgin. That's the best thing you can be called. And so naturally the opposite of that is randi. And so it's the worst thing you can be called. And it's so not the worst thing that you can be called. And I don't even care But it is the first place most men in our country will go to when they're trying to put a girl down. I think that somewhere wrapped up in all of this, in Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh, there's this talk about how women are held up and they're like put on a pedestal and how much they're respected by society and by their religions. But at the same time, you know, these women are getting the shit kicked out of them. So it doesn't really feel like anyone's being put on a pedestal at all. It's like gaslighting. It's so confusing to me, this idea that there's this trickery that happens. Completely. It's, you put these women in a golden cage. So you're, you're calling them goddess and that they shouldn't have to, you know, I don't want you to work. I don't want you to have any hardship. And women are so amazing and women are goddesses and blah, blah, blah. But really, that's all just to sort of trick them into some sort of like uh, complacency and make them think that, They will be taken care of. And really, at the end of the day, what's happened is their freedoms have been completely taken away from them. It all comes down to economics, too, because cultures like ours encourage women so much to marry and have children so young that you have to be a very special type of person to not let go of your career and to really remain an equal partner in your relationship so that you never get taken advantage of. So we talked about this a little bit before we started recording the podcast, this idea that patriarchy doesn't just live outside the door, but it also lives inside the home. And I think it's so amazing that, you know, you're living a life where your father, your mother-in-law, your husband, they're all, you know, they're all part of the jokes that you make. Were you just born into this and you got lucky with your family unit, or have you had to break down patriarchy at home? Have you had to help your family members see things from a feminist vantage point? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was writing something recently, and one of the things that came up in that session was I always wanted to be born into a feminist family. Like, my dad was not a feminist. He's a great guy. He's very funny. I have this irreverent sense of humor, which he totally thinks is hilarious when I do it too. The Air Force, which is where I was raised, the Indian Air Force, is especially his generation of pilots and and whatnot. Making dirty jokes was never a problem. And so long as you made people laugh, it was fine. But feminism and equality and raising the girls to think that they're completely equal, that's different. And I think sometimes I catch my dad having very different expectations for me than he does for my mother. So he is more likely to tell my husband that he has to support my dreams and wishes. But is he walking the walk with my mom? Mm, I don't think so. I do have arguments with my dad a lot and uh, with my husband all the time. I mean, I just read this great opinion piece in the New York Times. He says the hashtag I am sexist has to start trending and men have to own it. Like even the so-called, like the most supportive husband out there needs to look at his actions and his words every single day. And he has to own the fact that basically it's not his fault. He was raised like that. It's the society. It's so institutionalized. Men have to behave a certain way. And that way is sexist. Right. And men have a choice. I think that's what you're saying, right? They have a choice. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Shana. I'm really happy I did this.
This conversation gave me so much to think about. I mean, we went sci-fi and considered a totally altered reality in which women don't marry or fall into prescriptive roles. Women can't call men. Women talk out loud about the period. No more darkness of shame. Radhika breaks down patriarchy, that system that tells us just how women are supposed to stay within the lines of gendered norms. And she breaks down this system, this way of looking at the world, one laugh, one satire, one sketch at a time. I want to dedicate this first episode to my mom, who stepped outside so many gendered norms. Thanks for paving the way for me. Thank you for listening to Her Ganja Won't Smudge. I'm your host, Shauna. If you want to get in touch with us and rage or have a good cry or just tell us what you're thinking, look for our webpage online or find us on social media. Until next week.